say good afternoon now. And it's a charter day good afternoon. Charter day 330. So it's a big day in Williamsburg. And it's a big day in the geology department. This is our first brown bag of the semester. It's nice to see familiar faces, some new faces, some faces from across campus. So thank you for all joining the geology department today. This is what we think is a cool tradition. Most Fridays in the geology department, we have some kind of an informal presentation. Our students give them, our guests, our alums, and this is kicking off the 2023 semester. So for the students who are here, I guess have a few little bits of information. We got a lot more brown bags that are coming. Um, the other things that are out there that you probably want to know, um, Nyla's blog post is about to drop any moment. Uh, and then on Monday, we're going to put the uh, announcement up and you can sign up to go on the department field trip. All right. There's been a lot of like, oh, yeah, when's that happening? Next Monday, that will be here. Is the department field trip open to alumni in the background? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll put it in the back of the band, but um, we would love to have you. We're going into a tunnel. We might take you into the tunnel, but not bring you out. Um, so today we're excited to have one of our own back. Uh, Riley Bates is here, and Riley graduated from William and Mary in 1981, um, back when the geology department was in another building in a faraway place on campus. And Riley has done a bunch of different things during his career, um, and he's going to talk a little bit about that, which means I don't necessarily have to. Um, but the other thing that Riley has stayed connected to the department in a very, very good way. Um, Riley has helped us reach a lot of our goals for how we engage with students and do things. So I'm delighted to have him here. Riley had the opportunity to go to Africa last year, and he is going to share what he learned about Kenya with all of us. So let's uh, welcome Riley back to Way Mary. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first thing is, uh, I was talking to a friend the other day, and he asked me, oh, this is just about Kenya, and he didn't know much about geology, and I said, no, it really is anything to do with Kenya. It's like that whole part of Africa, so it should be called an overview of East African geology, because I think all of you all know that geology doesn't really like usually stop at uh, uh, some sort of defined borders. Um, and then my other one here is what a retired William Mary geologist did on summer vacation. Uh, I'll get into it in a minute, but uh, the last most recent company I worked with went bankrupt during the pandemic. So I took that as a sign to uh, retire and stop looking again. And uh, so I had an opportunity to go to Kenya and I did. Um, this talk was uh, first presented uh, in September on a granite inselberg. I'm sorry if I have to read a bunch of this stuff. So many of these words are sort of new to me too. Um, uh, in, in a place called West Savo, Kenya. Uh, I went on a 12-day walk in Kenya with uh, or nine other people. There were 10 clients on this walk. And so it was first presented there and it's revised and prepared for you guys. And I have to say uh, apologies to start because uh, I am retired. My laptop doesn't have a battery. My scanner stopped working. So to take the things that are in here, I actually had to photograph pages of the book, email them to myself and cut them. So, you know, it's not as polished as some of this stuff, but I, I had done a few PowerPoints in my life. And when it was first presented, I didn't have electricity, uh, internet or any of that. It was just sitting on top of a hill with a couple of pieces of paper. And so I, to, to get this one, I had to transform you know, take pictures of those pieces of paper and put it in the PowerPoint. So this is the first time it's been presented in this format. Uh, over here is a typical place we were walking, but those are not our footprints, those are elephant footprints. Um, this is where it was first presented, and I didn't know what an Inselberg was. Uh, I've been out of, you know, away from school a long time. Wikipedia says, like a lot of things in geology, as soon as you look it up, then it uses some other word you've never heard of. It's an insel bird or... Thank you. Well, I've never heard that. I'm like, what, what's, you know, why do they describe something with a word I don't even... Anyways, it's an isolated rock hill in the Ridge. And in uh, East Kenya, where I was, these are pretty much all granite. You can kind of see some in the background there also. And they just stick up a couple hundred feet. So when I first presented it, it was in an afternoon after we finished our walk. 
and we sat up here on top of the hill. And uh, kindly, as you can see, our host had brought us some uh, some libations to enjoy while we sat up there and listened to my talk. Um, agenda. Okay, we'll go through an introduction. Um, during uh, the initial talk, the uh, 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 team leader there asked me to talk about the formation of the Earth. I did that. You know, it was a 60-second talk. I decided not to talk about that with you all because I think, except for some people in this room, I, most of you all know the formation of the earth a lot better than I do. I actually looked it up on the airplane over there because I'd forgotten. So I, I crossed that out. If anyone needs it, I've got a slide in the back and I can hit it at the end. Anyways, medium time, recent time, and then some interesting factoids. And these are some things I learned uh, from my uh, my guidebook as I went along that just struck me. A lot of this talk was things that just struck me. So uh, sorry if you're not interested, but for me, they were interesting. Um, I've been told to keep questions for the end, but if something's uh, totally out of the ordinary and you need help as we go along, you know, do what you have to do. Uh, acknowledgements. Uh, three people I need to acknowledge. One is Chris Hockett, winner Mary class of 1981. This is Chris over here. That is another one of those Inselbergs sticking up. And I believe we're standing on one here. And that is the local drink of Kenya. It's called a Tusker. The Tusker is the good beer. And uh, uh, Chris um, uh, went on to law school. But anyways, Chris and I have been on four continents together hiking. Uh, we've been, uh, I was looking at this map, Northwest uh, Thailand and Burma. We went for two weeks on a motorcycle. We went to the uh, Karakoram and Hindu Kush in the northern part of Pakistan for uh, four weeks back in 1986. And then in 1987, we went to Ecuador and uh, hiked up uh, Cotopaxi and Chimborazo. And Chimborazo is on there at 6,200 meters. And all of these places we went, Chris, who's a... Uh, uh, pretty smart guy, he kept asking me about the geology and I knew nothing. I mean, I knew a little bit about uh, Ecuador just because it's a subduction plate. And, you know, the mountains go up after the subduction. But the other places I knew nothing about and we'd meet other people and they'd say, oh, you're a geologist. Tell us about that and that. No clue. Absolutely none at all. So Chris and his son invited me to go on this walk with them because they met this guy before who is our expedition leader. And I determined that I was gonna learn about the geology of where we were going so I could answer questions. And then in communications with the guides, uh, I asked them about books on geology. They knew nothing about the geology of the area. They knew the flora, the fauna, the animals, the geology, no clue, but anyways, as we corresponded, they then asked if I would do a 20 or 30 minute, they called it a, uh, a fireside chat one evening uh, while I was there. And uh, being a, a good speaker, I, uh, I said, yes. And so I, I educated myself and then I educated them, or that's what I hope. Um, Roger Skoon, Department of Geology in South Africa. Uh, this is my Bible, I got this book. It, they print it to order. I didn't even know they did that these, nowadays. So it's never out of stock. It's never in stock. When you order it, they say it'll be there in two weeks. We need to print it and send it to you. And so it's just excellent. But it's called The Geology of the National Parks of Centra and, and Southern Kenya and Northern Tanzania. And it's Geotourism of the Gregory Rift Valley. And it, it's just a great book. It's written, it says for generalists, but it's got a lot of pretty heavy duty stuff. And as you'll see, most of the uh, slides from here, they're either photos I took or they're photos I took of this book and emailed to myself and cut and pasted into here. And then this gentleman here, 74 years old, Ian Allen, he was our expedition leader. He runs a company in Kenya called Tropical Ice. He's lived in Kenya since he's eight years old. Uh,
and he is a sort of a, a legend in his own time and a legend in his own mind. Um, uh, he's been to the top of Everest three times. He's been up a bunch of other mountains also. He now has a uh, fake hip and a fake knee. He's been up Kilimanjaro more than 50 times. And he's not afraid to tell you these things either. He's full of stories, but he's still leading these 125 mile walks, um, carrying nothing but his uh, 50 caliber elephant gun. And that's that elephant head behind him. Um, and another interesting thing about my good friend, Chris Hockett, just so you all make good friends, that's his son with us. His son was the youngest person on the walk at 26 years old. Uh, the oldest person on the walk was 78 years old, even older than Ian. And his son is named Riley. So that is a friend indeed. <laughs> okay, me. Uh, Riley Bates, Bachelor of Geology, 1981. I've got some, a uh, couple of paternity brothers in the background who will, uh, who would let you know that I probably didn't study as hard as many of you all here. But the fact of the matter is I graduated in four years and only went to summer school once. So that, that was a pretty amazing, amazing <laughs> they could attest to that. Uh, first GEO job started in 81. I went in the oil and gas industry, started in Denver, and I started in Denver because this company said you can go international. They gave me a choice of moving to Singapore or Windsor, England. I'd never heard of Singapore, so I went to Singapore in 1982 when I was 23 years old. And uh, I worked on the rigs. I worked on the oil rigs in Kalimantan, Borneo, Indonesia, and Thailand, and ended up working all around Southeast Asia. In 1989, I kind of stopped working on the oil rigs. For any of you that don't know, on the oil rigs, there's always one geologist. There might be 100 people on the oil rig doing what they do, and there's one geologist, kind of a lonely figure. Generally speaking, I'd be the only person on the oil rig that probably went to college. Maybe some of them went half a year at some point. A lot of them didn't finish high school. but. Uh, it was a whole lot of fun because I was a young guy bopping around Asia. In uh, 1989, I left that and went to work for an oil company in Jakarta, moved back to Bangkok, moved to Hungary. And after 23 years abroad, finally got sucked into Texas where all the companies have their headquarters. So I spent 23 years international and then 16 years working in, uh, in, the, uh, in the States. Seven direct employers, independent consultant for a while. Um, I've worked in 17 countries and resided means I have permanent residency in six different countries. So I, I bopped around a lot. Uh, my primary role in the oil and gas was what they call formation evaluation and geologic operations, planning for well bore operations, oversee well bore data acquisition, and then very importantly, the interpretation of that data either you know, real time at the well site or remotely, or a single well or basin wide. So it was a whole lot of fun. Um, and as I said, my most recent employer, actually we were drilling and fracking in West Texas. Uh, I was in Houston and it went bankrupt in the pandemic, but that's life. Um, okay, now we're gonna uh, start here. Uh, first of all, uh, just to familiarize ourselves with where we are, uh, we're going to first talk about this little walk that we did. We're going to deal with Kenya, here are the surrounding countries. This map didn't have Sudan and South Sudan uh, border in it quite yet. Focus in on Kenya here. We're going to be dealing mostly with this area over here um, because that's where I was. But uh, uh, there's a, a, a lot of other geology in Kenya also. And just a little scale bar I threw in. This is 116 miles. We walked from that corner of the park to that corner of the park. And there's the good old mountain of Kilimanjaro. Uh, getting down a little more nitty gritty, here's that same thing we just saw. Here's a bigger scale of that park, and here's a smaller scale. And uh, I shamelessly stole these from uh, uh, our handouts for this walk. And these were the camps we had along the walk. Basically, we walked along the river, 
Uh, the brown is a kind of our walk, and these other things are our camps. And uh, some people have asked me what was the most interesting thing about this walk. And in hindsight, it wasn't the animals, it wasn't the flora, it wasn't the fauna. Um, the geology was pretty interesting, but it wasn't that. This was in September and October of this year. And I didn't catch on to it at the time, even though I knew it, but we had no electricity for 12 days. We had obviously no internet for 12 days. We had no nothing for 12 days. There were 10 people on the walk, or I should say 10 clients, our expedition leader, and we had 23 uh, support staff. Um, no cars, no nothing. And so you're just there with yourself, and with your thoughts and with these other people that you meet and um, you know some good some bad some ugly but you'd be walking and you'd see a feature and the guide leader would say you see that hill way over there it's a little teeny thing you know we'll be there in four days and sure enough in four days you get there i think the most we ever walked in the day was 19 miles and the least was about seven so generally we walk, we crossing rivers where we had to ford this river on average, uh, at least two times a day, sometimes four times a day. But you know, you're just kind of by yourself with your thoughts. And um, it takes some getting used to, but you know, just imagine not having electricity for 12 days. It's interesting. Uh, we did cross one railway and one uh, one highway right through the middle. So we did see some other people as we crossed this. Other than that, we didn't see anyone else on this entire walk for 12 days. Um, just a little, you know, some things of what we did see. These are all pictures that uh, that I took, you know, some elephants, lions, and giraffes. And this is typically how we walked. And this is not a walking path. That would be a, a an animal path. So we, we were not on we were not on hiking trails we were on animal trails the whole time. And, uh, the the uh, our expedition leader this guy here here is again he was very proud of himself for being able to sneak up on uh, sleeping lions. So as a lot of maybe some of you know lions sleep about twenty hours a day or so. Um, and so uh, he or his, his guide he'd always have kind of people out in front to the sides figuring out where the animals were and they'd run back to him and tell him. And so sometimes we'd take an hour detour because they determined there's some lions over there. So we'd go and get on the correct wind side of them and sneak up on them. And then he'd throw rocks at them and wake them up. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. <laughs> That's us on our daily march. And it was a march. Um, what am I saying here? Okay, here's the digital terrain image of our walking area. We go across these two parks. Um, but the one thing I wanted to point out here is this river coming down here, the Athi River. It connects with the uh, Savo River right here, and Balana. And we walk from here on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro all the way to this end. But look right here, you can kind of see this feature along the river getting smaller and smaller as it comes down. And, uh, and here is the same thing on a, uh, a different type of image. And that's called the Yada Plateau. And I read about the Yada Plateau and I didn't know really what it meant. We'll get into it more later, but it is the famous Yada Plateau. It's a basalt lava flow and it's only five to 20 meters thick. Um, it's about 12 million years ago, it was, uh, uh, it came out and it started somewhere right about up in here. Um, and it's only anywhere from 100 to uh, 100 meters to 2,000 meters wide, 300 kilometers long. And uh, here's a picture I took at, let's see, looking northeast. This would have been down in here looking at it in the northeast. And the interesting thing about this lava flow is that uh, it's now 1,000 feet above the plains around it because everything else around it eroded and the lava, uh, uh, the basalt at the top kept, uh, kept it from eroding beneath it. So now it's exposed, but when it was deposited, it filled in the low spots. And so we walked along this Yada Plateau for quite a while. And it's pretty famous. It's in a lot of movies out of Africa. Everything of Kenya shows planes going at the Yada and coming up. 
Um, we'll, we'll see more of the auto. Um, this is not a focus of this talk, but it's something to keep in mind because everyone hears about Kenya, geology, and wildlife, and they're interrelated, uh, more so than many places on Earth, because there's been a tremendous amount of geologic activity in the last uh, 20 million years, especially the last 5 million years. And what this does is it uh, separates the terrains into ever uh, increasing smaller and smaller little plateaus and areas that are blocked off from each other. And so therefore the animals have to uh, survive, they have to adapt, they have to evolve or die out. Uh, for instance, in Kenya, there's 45 types of antelopes. Uh, we probably saw about five or six of them. I wouldn't even know them all. Um, but all of this rifting and uplift and volcanics produce these smaller and smaller areas and the animals have to somehow or another figure out a way to live. So the animals five miles away wouldn't look the same as the ones over here because there's something separating them such that they, they evolve differently. It, it's pretty bizarre. So it contributes to this isolation of species. Um, uh, a lot of climate change over the last few million years, evolve quickly or die. And of course, this is what attracts the visitors to Kenya to see these uh, amazing variety and concentration of animals. And of course, uh, arid conditions prevail, but uh, a lot of animals. Why? The big question, geology. So over the last few million years, the volcanics give nutrients to the soil. Monsoons, uh, rains hit the highlands. And then in the highlands, these volcanic rocks soak up the water. It goes down underground. It comes up 50 miles away in springs and feeds uh, places that shouldn't have any water. So a lot of the rivers there, you can't walk to the headlands of the rivers because there aren't any, it's springs. And this river that we walked on, we went to the spring that, that uh, formed it also. And it's just kind of bizarre. It's a big river that starts right here from the spring. Okay, medium time. So um, forget the formation of the earth. Uh, you guys probably know more about this than I, because you know I've forgotten it all. But uh, generally speaking, about 200 million years ago, there was one big landmass. Here it's called Pangaea. Some people call it Gondwana. And there was one sea, Tethys. Um, landmass started to break up about 200 million years ago. The African plate started to shape, take place or take shape about 200 million years ago. And then an interesting thing, if you look at the African plate here, 200 million years ago, here's 145, here's 65 million years ago, and here's present day, it hasn't moved a whole lot. It pretty much looks like it always did. And the reason for that is because it was continually uplifted and eroded. And this is still ongoing. The African plate is continually going up, up, and up, and then just getting eroded down and then repeat that cycle and repeat. So Africa is domed in the center, and that's still occurring, gentle dip away from the center. We'll see more about that. So regional plateaus were formed. The basement rock is exposed at the surface. Um, uh, there's no wrong, uh, no wrong, uh, sorry, no young rocks. There's no sedimentary rocks, except the very recent stuff that's uh, filled in some lakes and rifts. Everything's been eroded away due to the repeated uplift. Some of the oldest rocks on Earth are exposed to the surface. So geologically speaking, not much happened in EMEA, uh, East Africa for a very long time. Uh, you know, some people might say it's boring. So only two types of rocks exist in Kenya uh, from these older ones. Both are uh, old, hard, crystalline, plutonic, and metamorphic. There's uh, the Central Africa Craton, which is 2.6 to about 2.8 million years, billion years, sorry, billion years. And that's looked at the surface in West uh, Kenya. Where we were, the surface is called the Mozambique Belt, and it's about uh, 550 to 800 million year old rocks, quartzite schists, marbles, granitic plutons. 
So again, you know, there's just nothing. All of this stuff here, there might have been the pot deposition at some time, but it's all gone. But then you come to recent times. And so uh, something started to happen pretty recently. And so right now there's, uh, there's three features in uh, East Africa at present. There's these crystalline basin complexes we just talked about. There's these uplifting regional plateaus that are uh, due to that doming, continental scale uplift. And then the thing that everyone hears about these days is the recent and uh, still active East Africa Rift System. In the books, they call it the EARS, East Africa Rift System. And this is that book that I bought and it's well uh, worn. So now we're gonna focus on this rift system. It's gonna stop being boring geology. So all this beautiful pictures that you've seen of East Africa, uh, it's all in the last two, five, 20 million years. So starting about 30 million years ago, the rift started to happen and it started to happen up by the Red Sea and it, it started to split open about 30 million years ago. The rift system reached Kenya about 20 million years ago. It reached Tanzania about 5 million years ago. And so it, it's progressively, uh, it's like a zipper opening up, opened up at the top and now it's opening up at the bottom. And so it's, it's still continuing down uh, Tanzania. Um, uh, these, uh, uh, this purple here is the Central Africa craton around 2 billion years ago. We were over here. This is that Mozambique belt. And you can almost see the dome here of the continual push-up. Um, the main periods of rifting in Kenya are this thing called the Gregory Rift, and it's about four to one million years ago. And uh, this continental rifting is associated with alkaline styles of magma, and these alkaline magmas also form a whole bunch of lakes in the, in the center, which are uh, filled with alkaline waters and weird stuff growing in them. And it's also associated with explosive style, uh, style volcanoes. So this rifting, has dissected this regional plateau boring stuff into some of these uh, iconic pictures that you see of East Africa and volcanoes and mountains and rifts. Um, that didn't occur just four or five million years ago in Southern Kenya. Um, this one uh, I found interesting. Here it is again. This was that rift starting. These uh, green things are volcanoes. Um, the more intense volcanisms down to the south, East Africa rift system, different rifts. But there is some debate in the geologic community as uh, whether or not this is going to form a new plate. In the literature, it's called the Somalian plate, or here, Somalian microplate. And so as this thing's opening up, the idea is at some point, this is going to separate. And whether you want to say Africa moves west and this moves east, I don't know. Waters will fill in and there'll be a new sea there. And I haven't seen uh, any literature that talks about what they might call the name of that, uh, that sea. And it might not happen. You know, this is geology. This stuff might stop. And if it stops, it'll be a rift that went nowhere, so to speak. Or it might be a new plate someday. Um, what do we have over here? Uh, this is kind of the same thing showing, you know, some of these systems coming down and you can see these lakes filling in the rifts as they start to open. Okay, here's my geology talk. Rifting is formed by the uplift, stretching, thinning, and extension of the crust. It's presumed that there's a deep-seated mantle plume upwelling of lichna magma in the existing zone of weakness. These might be the same zones of weakness that uh, started the uh, separation of the plates 200 million years ago when Gondwana broke up. Um, probably a rejuvenation of these older ones. Uh, there's three main stages of rifting. There's the free rift, the half robin, and the full robin. And so, uh, 
As you go further north, things are in the full robin. Down in the south, it's a half robin. And the pre rift is uh, occurring in the south down in uh, uh, Tanzania right now. So the pre rift, you know, it's pushing up. You've got some volcanism, but you don't have any rifts yet. You've got uh, uh, some uh, basalts that would come leaking out of this stuff, and that's what that Yaka Plateau is. A uh, half robin extension pushes it up further. I don't really have a slide on that, but it can be thousands of feet of push ups, and it starts to join these isolated features into linear trends. So it's a true rip system. And uh, this uh, uh, half robin has intense volcanism of all types. And then the full robin. These huge down faulted uh, uh, blocks, which can be five or six thousand feet in Kenya, very uh, symmetrical. And then on the sides, you have isolated uh, volcanoes. And so that's what you see right now in Ken uh, Kenya and Tanzania. Okay, uh, digital terrain image over here, 3,500. Um, this does not show lakes since it's a digital terrain image. Another half province to the south. So down here, you can see there's a half province over here. It's pretty flat. Further north, you know, here's a rift valley. A little hard to see, but, you know, it's a full province system, full province system. Uh, here's the same thing in a satellite image. Um, and, of course, you can see the lakes. You know, these are pretty much the same image. You know, here's Lake Victoria, here's Lake Victoria. Here are these lakes. And I think, uh, Dr. Rowan, you, you worked on uh, one of these lakes somewhere? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where is that? It's further up north, isn't it? Yeah, right here. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Up here? Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, here's Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Maru. So basically, the, the volcanism to the south is younger than the volcanism to the north. Um, oops, I've got two cross sections here cross section one, cross section two. You know, I had to throw them in since it's geology. We're not going to get into it uh, too heavily. But here you can see this Mozambique belt. These are the 500 to 800 million year old rocks kind of on the uh, east side of Kenya. Here's the uh, two billion year old rocks on the west side. And you can kind of see this basic doming and then this young stuff here in the middle. Um, this is meters. So you can kind of get an idea of some of these escarpments. They're pretty big. And you know, you've got some huge changes. Here's Lake Nakuru, it's 1,700 meters. Mount Kenya, 5,200 meters. You know, th this is pretty heavy duty stuff. And the rift system can be, the further north you go, the rift system can be 100 kilometers wide. The further south you go, you can reach some points where you can jump across it. You know, it's just starting, proto rift. Uh, here's that uh, uh, cross section two, which is down in the south uh, in Tanzania. So it's more hot province predominant rather than uh, full province. But even still, you know, you've got some pretty, uh, you know, that's, 2,000 meters, you know, you've got some pretty good, uh, some pretty good relief. Uh, Kilimanjaro looks small here because this one went across the southern slopes of Kilimanjaro, but it's almost 6,000 meters tall, so it would really be sitting up here if the cross section had gone across the uh, top of it. Um, let's see, two broad categories of volcanic rocks in rip systems. One are flood events. That's that Yaka Plateau again, back in the background. And again, that's five to 20 meters thick. And beneath it are these uh, uh, rocks that are 600 to 800 million years old underneath rocks that are just 12 million years old. Um, this is Mount Kilimanjaro in the background. That's kind of walking in front of it. And, uh, and it's uh, explosive extrusive, it's outside of the physical rift system, exploiting existing zones of uh, weakness. And Mount Kilimanjaro was only formed about 2 million years ago, and it's still, uh, it's still uh, extruding. 
Uh, just for scale, here's a picture. A friend of mine was on Mount Kilimanjaro in January, and you took this picture going to the south, southwest, over towards Mount Meru. And these things are 43 miles apart, but you know they're, they're pretty big. This one gets up to 19,000 feet. That one's about 15,000 feet. Um, this one's a busy map. I'm not planning to review it in any detail uh, unless anyone wants to come back to it. But you know, we were walking down this area, and this is that thing that kept at least attracting me. It's called the Yatta Plateau. And it, it started from these volcanics up here in the Nairobi, and it comes down here, boom, 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 boom. And uh, I, I just found it fascinating, something that's five to 20 meters thick. It was deposited in lows. You know, it infilled, it was, a, it was a oozy. So it infilled the lows, and now it's a thousand feet high. Our group leader there, that Mr. Ian Allen, he knew all about the Yatta Plateau. He thought the Yatta Plateau basalts were a thousand meters thick. And since he's lived there 74 minus eight, whatever, 60 odd years, I believed him. And I kept going back to my book, which said it was five to 20 meters thick. And so finally, I, you know, the, light, the light went on. It is five to 20 meters thick. It forms a plateau and the stuff below it was never eroded. This guy who lived there all his life thought it was just this, this thing that built up to a thousand meters tall and is a thousand meters thick. So uh, I didn't have much luck convincing him otherwise. He, he had his own opinions. That's that plateau again. Um, uh, you know, we walked along it for quite a few days, so I took a lot of pictures of it. You can kind of see the basalt up there and these rocks beneath it are much older. Um, they still have some act uh, right here. You see all this dark stuff. If you're not looking carefully, you think it's uh, clouds, you know, clouds uh, forming dark on the landscape. It's actually not. It's uh, basalt lava flows from the 1700s. And uh, one day we were walking along the Sava River here, and we don't always walk like this, but this day we were. And I looked across the river. This is directly across from where we are here. And these rocks are those 500 to 800 million year old uh, basement rocks. And on top of it is a lava flow that was dated from 1865. So you talk about unconformities, you know. And so I stopped the group. I was, I'm going to say, real popular and said, look across there. And, you know, our, our expedition leaders said, no, we got to keep going. You know, we got we to be on time. And I'm like, Man, but look at that, you know, you just, I feel proud of that photo. But uh, that, that is a real unconformity. Um, this is a cinder cone in Savo West. This is formed in 1865. Before then it was flat. And they actually put a road up it. See right there, it's the track. It's now a tourist attraction. Um, this one I uh, stole from someplace. This is a, a western. Uh, uh, this is this is the Gregory Rift near Lake uh, Natron, northern Tanzania. And so this is just showing you some of those uh, some of those rifts. You know, this stuff is all pushed up, and then lava forms and makes plateaus. Um, that's my famous shot of plateau. That's me with my nice little hat and uh, my tusker. So uh, pretty much every morning, um, we, we'd wake up, breakfast was at 6.15, we'd start walking at, uh, at 7. We'd, uh, we'd always walk. First thing we did in the morning was walk across the river and walk on the other side of the river. Because one side of the river has, uh, I don't know if I'd call them tracks, but uh, four-wheel drive tracks that they can, they would take our camp, they would move our camp every week, every, every night in a four-wheel drive trucks. We never got to go there, right, you know, but uh, they moved it, but we'd always walk on the side of the river that didn't have any, uh, any tracks. Um, coming towards the end, these are some things that I thought struck me. I, I call them interesting factoids. I'll, I'll show you in a second. Uh, the famous Victoria Nile River, a reversed course. 
only about 30,000 years ago. I, I just thought that was amazing. I mean, obviously you can't stand there and watch it, but uh, you know, one year it went that way and a little while later it went the other way. Just think about that. Uh, and this is due to that continual uplift that I was talking about. That uplift is still ongoing. Um, Lake Victoria has dried up a few times. Mount Kilimanjaro, which a lot of people look at, its last glacial maximum was 20,000 years ago. It had a huge ice cap at that time. But 12,000 years ago, climate change, there was no ice on Kilimanjaro. 8,000 years ago, it's back up to about 100 square kilometers of ice, and it'll be back to none pretty quickly. Um, here's uh, that uh, river I was talking about. Here's Lake Victoria. Here are the rift systems. Um, this is called the Albertine Rift. This is the Gregory Rift. Lake Victoria is odd in that it's between rift systems. It's not these elongated uh, lakes like the rest of them. Um, and so uh, it, it, it was formed, oh, let's see, between two rift systems uh, uh, about 1.6 million years ago. And then up to 30,000 years ago, this river, these lakes didn't exist. The outflow from Lake Victoria was going down this river called the Tonga River over these dotted lines, which were rivers at that time into Lake Edward, there's Lake George there, up to Lake Albert. And then it flows out the top, Albert Nile, the Nile River, and it goes up to Sudan and Egypt. Anyways, about 30,000 years ago, the doming of Africa was continuing such that this area got uplifted and this river started flowing instead of from east to west, it started flowing from west to east back into Lake Victoria. It filled up Lake Victoria and Lake Victoria had nowhere to go and it found a new outlet up here. And so about 25,000 years ago, the Victoria Nile was formed. It came down here, it made this lake and then it came along here when this filled up. Uh, it came along, made some waterfalls at Murchison Falls, where previously there was no water. It fed into Lake Albert and went out the top. Um, so this was only about 13,000 years ago that it started pouring out the top. And, and I just personally found that fascinating that um, I'll show some pictures. This is at uh, Murchison Falls. This is, a, this is a lot of water. So this is the water coming out of the um, coming out of Lake Victoria, trying to find its way to Lake Albert. You know, it's, it's a lot of water. You know, this is not, uh, not some little stream. I just uh, found that kind of interesting. Uh, just some images of Mount Kilimanjaro, because so many people look at it. Uh, both of these images are 2017. Um, this is what it looks like now. You can't see it here, but this is the normal walking route up along here. The actual top, the highest point of Kilimanjaro is around here. This is that crater. You can't see it too well on my photo. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to show here is that about eight, uh, I'm sorry, uh, about 20,000 years ago, Mount Kilimanjaro was all the way down to this line with ice, which would be way off of this, this scale. You know, it, it, right now the only ice, this is not ice, these are clouds. The only ice left is this little bit here, which is that, and a little bit on the side, which is that stuff. I'm sorry, this is 2017, so this is correct. It's melting pretty quickly. But you know, climate change has been occurring forever. For 20,000 years ago, it was that large. And then interesting, there were some warm spells. 12,000 years ago, there was no ice. And then by about 8,000 years ago, it gotten cold again and ice covered this inside circle. And uh, 2040 or before it should be back to no ice. Um, here's a photo from 1938 showing the uh, ice. Here's that crater. This is that same thing in 2017. Here's 1912 showing the ice, 2011 showing the ice. This one here also is 1912. 
I'm going to wrap it up. I've uh, got uh, some extra slides at the back if anyone needs it, but we're going to call it a day. I think some of you might have class. I'll take any questions. <laughs>